Welcome back to the shop, Jeff's Woodman Shop here in Baltimore, Maryland. Today I'm going to go over what I look at when I'm starting a flute overhaul. Everything that goes into the process of determining what I need to do. Obviously the short answer is everything, uh, but you know, we have to be more detailed than that. Um, have to talk about all the different details that the technicians think about that the players don't even realize are there. Um, so I have here a flute. It has been played probably 15 years, I think, um, on this set of pads. I have replaced a couple of pads here and there over the years. Um, I've been helping this player maintain her flute for oh five six years now maybe I think um, and she decided it's time for an overhaul and yeah 15 years on the same set of pads it's time for an overhaul I tell everybody I don't care if you're playing piccolo or Barry sax um, three to five years on a set of pads and then you're into the land of diminishing returns. Certainly I have customers who blow out a set of pads in a year. Um, that's just the way it goes. And I've got lots of people who are going 10, 15 uh, years or more on the same set of pads with no problem. So it's entirely subjective, but after th three to five years, even if you're not playing it too much, the materials are going to start to deteriorate. Uh, the skins on the pads are natural. They're going to deteriorate. The cushion inside is going to compress and not spring back to where it used to be as much. Uh, so after five years, yeah, I can justify an overhaul just on time. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And if you can get 15 years out of a set of pads, great. Um, I can't fix everybody's flute. There are more flutes out there than there are people to fix them. So if you're doing fine on 10, 15 year track record, great. But if you need it done, if you're concerned, eh, this just doesn't play the same as it used to, you know, if you're at seven, eight, nine years, it could be because things are starting to wear down and not be as consistent. So, we have here a handmade flute. I have covered up the maker. I've covered up the maker on the head joint, and it's a different maker on the head joint anyway, but that's all right. These are going to be very general things. I don't want anything that I say to be taken as a slight or an attack on any particular maker or style or anything like that. Um, these are generalities. These are what I would look at in any flute. Um, technicians who are watching this video are probably going to be able to identify this particular brand of flute um, pretty quickly, uh, but keep it to yourself. Um, so, first thing I look at, obviously I pull it out of the case and there's a piece of scotch tape here on the head joint for fit. So that's something I'll need to do is fit the head joint. While I'm at it I will check the foot fit. Foot feels okay. There's a little bit of wobble. We'll see if that wobble gets any worse after cleaning but I will probably try to address that a little bit. While I am looking at the foot joint I feel inside here because if you have the foot on there and you get a little bit of whiplash damage going on the end of the flute, it will show up in the bore and you'll be able to feel a ridge in there. And this is very, very common. Um, 
fortunately not very common on handmade instruments because people with handmade instruments tend to be a little more careful than uh, people with factory built instruments just in general uh, but if it happens it happens and it can be fixed um, other thing to notice this is a soldered tone hole flute so if I were to feel any distortion in here at the end I'm gonna check that tone hole and really determine, scrutinize that, and make sure the solder hasn't come loose on that. Uh, a soldered joint, I can stress a soldered joint today, it could pop loose today, it could pop loose in six months. It's just the nature of the beast, and uh, something that um, can be very frustrating to technicians probably equally or more so to players but you know if this takes a drop in the case you know absolute worst case scenario we start having um, tone holes pop off one by one uh, it, it's it rarely rarely happens like that but especially the older the instrument um, the the solder that's used in here some of the elements in the solder can go fugitive over time so you have uh, problems with the bond and it gets very brittle and all sorts of technical details that I can do a whole video on in itself. So back to assessing the instrument. So we know that the joints, what well, we have to do with the joints. Obviously on the head joint we're going to be replacing the cork. That's just standard procedure on uh, an overhaul. And we're examining for any distortions in the reflection. And as the clock chimes and tells me it's lunchtime. Um, dents up in here. Uh, it, it, some people will say you've got a cork up there, a little ding up there isn't that big a deal. But it can impact on how the cork seals depending on the particulars. So we're just looking for any abnormalities here. And this is always more difficult. You know, as you can see, we've got a good deal of tarnish going on this flute. I think this flute, it's been probably 18 months since I've seen it. Um, pandemic and all, it might might have been longer. Um, but I am doing the same visual evaluation. I've got my strong light up above that gives me straight line reflections down the body. And I can very easily see if there's any distortions in the reflection. And that any distortions that I see, that's going to be a red flag for looking for trouble in that area. So, foot looks okay. Looking at the body, other than tarnish and dust bunnies, I don't see anything of concern. Although I am going to take a closer look at that tone hole. Um, and I'll get into that more later. I don't like the looks of the joint where the bottom of that tone hole meets the body. The gap there looks very large. Um, it's probably fine, but I'm probably going to bust out my little digital microscope and really scrutinize that hard. Um, make sure there's not going to be any impending problems there. Uh, the thing that caught my attention was the tarnish is not uniform. There's a there's a shiny spot right at the bottom of that tone hole where it meets the body and that's unusual. Uh, so that, that grabbed my attention so I'm going to scrutinize that later. Okay, done looking at all of the obvious things. Don't forget to check the back, check around the, um, the foot not the foot, the, the thumb key. And of course, 
looking down the bore. You don't want to look straight on at a light source. The, the bore being smooth and silver or gold is going to be very reflective. So if you're looking straight at a uniform light source, you're not going to see diddly. Uh, so you want to see like the edge of like a white piece of paper and then something dark. So you can move the flute around and track those reflections around and look for distortions. And as expected, no distortions. Um, another thing I will do, I'm not going to do it right now on camera because I have to dig the tool out, is I will run my steel body mandrel in uh, to see if it's bent. Uh, that happens every now and then, like you, know, you stick the flute under your arm or whatever. You can, you can flex the body just enough to bow it. Um, I have done enough trombone slide repairs in my career to know that just looking down this, sighting down the bore, it's it's not bent. I can see that from right now. That's that's pretty darn straight. So now we get on to the mechanisms. Um, first, I'm looking at you know the dust bunnies. I'm looking at are there any springs that are suspect, you know, with kinks in them or anything like that. And then I'm going to start looking at how things fit. And this is before I take anything apart. The most crucial part of any flute mechanism is this post right here in between the left hand keys and the right hand keys hiding right behind the knuckle trill lever or underneath your C-sharp trill lever. This is called the king post. And this is where the mechanisms from the, the rods come in and they meet at that post and the, the whole integrity of the mechanism is supported right there. Now this is a pinless mechanism. This is one of the one of the designs uh, from uh, Johann Brueger. Um, if you want to really annoy flute makers, you can call it an Adolf Sachs mechanism, which technically the principle of the mechanism is there's uh, where the points of leverage are. That was developed by Adolf Sachs in um, 1841 maybe 1840. It's a little fuzzy. Uh, what makes it different from Sachs's mechanism, of course, is how the king post factors into things. Um, but that's neither here nor there. And this is the point where the technicians are going to say, hey, I know who made that flute. So we will pull this apart. Oh, before I pull it apart, the way you can check, the way anyone can check King Post, kind of skipped over that part, is to grab onto the F sharp key and kind of wiggle it this way. Adjust my camera here just a hair. So you grab onto your F-sharp key and you try to wiggle it back and forth in this direction. And you're probably going to feel a little bit, you know, just a fuzz of wiggle back and forth. You want to make sure you're going straight and you're not going this way. Um, depending on the design, you can have a little bit of play this way and that's alright. Um, but you don't want, you know, this is axial movement along the axis, and this is radial movement. So, well, would that be radial? I don't know. Either way, perpendicular to the axis, you don't want any movement. And you can check um, 
either hanging on to the G key if it's an inline or if you can get your fingers in there the end of the knuckle trill and like I said you're gonna feel a little bit of wiggle hopefully you won't feel any wiggle at all but if you feel you know wow that feels kinda loose that's a serious problem that needs to be dealt with if that king post fit is out and this is much less common on the pinless mechanisms than it is on the pinned mechanisms because the pinned mechanisms you will literally have a point that goes into the post and over time that that point was is going to rotate every time the keys move and over time that's going to wear down and there are certain brands that are notorious for the king post wearing out um, other brands not so much it all depends on the metal that's used but also how much you're maintaining the flute if you're of the school of thought oh, I'll just play it until it stops playing and you're a self oiler applying oil every now and then if your mechanisms dry out and you get dirt in there and you add a little bit of oil you have just added cutting fluid so every time that key moves you're grinding away inside that post or at the end of the rod typically the gunk will stick to the softer material and grind away the harder material so the gunk will stick to the silver or nickel silver or whatever the bearing surface is inside that post and wear down the steel uh, conical bearing surface at the end and I have seen flutes where that's been worn down to a nub um, and that is entirely the fault of not having the flute serviced regularly and not having it clean the mechanism cleaned out is just years and years of grit grinding away at the steel so these feel good I don't like this one quite as much the left hand is a little bit loose but so I'll have to explore that and see what I'm dealing with so I'm gonna pull these keys off well, before I do that here's where you can check to see how the keys fit on their steels the D key down here has a little bit more axial play than I would like so I will try to take care of that but now let's pull these apart and you can see what's going on in the mechanism <laughs> 